So, um, so today I want to talk to you about building software as a service platform on CoreOS and using etcd. Um, we've been experimenting with CoreOS since about August 2014, um, and we actually delivered Yodeler uh, production-based version of it in November, entirely on CoreOS. So about me. So um, as I mentioned, I'm Ross Kuklinski. I'm the founder and CEO of Yodeler. Um, I also am a huge Node.js person, so I help run a Bay Node, which is the South Bay Area Node.js meetup. I'm involved with IOJS, and I love soccer. So if you like any of those things, I'd love to catch up with you during the happy hour. So first of all, what is Yodeler? So Yodeler is a browser-based audio communication platform. Uh, it runs entirely in your web browser. There's no plugins, no downloads, no user counts. You just click a link and you're in. Um, it's a lot like Google Hangouts or Skype, um, but the reason we built this, we actually built this originally um, as an internal tool. Um, our parent company builds sound and communication systems for flight simulators and military training, and they've been doing that for 25 years. And as a distributed team, we got fed up with all of the other collaboration and communication platforms, and we said, this is silly. We know how to do this. Why don't we just build a little internal app, and that's what we'll do. So my team, last February, February of 2014, in three weeks, built a prototype of Yodler, and we've been using it as an internal tool since then. But we had a couple of our, our we started using it for open source project, communica communicating with people. Um, we had some marketing and people started using Yodler as a um, sales platform. And we had some customers that were more excited about Yodler than they were about the flight simulation products. And so we realized we really needed to create a separate product, separate company to focus on doing that. Um, but in the process, the initial three week prototype was this gobbled together monolithic node WebRTC app thing. We realized that it wasn't going to scale. It wasn't manageable for us as a small development team to continue to build on top of that. So we decided to go back and revisit our entire application and structure. And we set out to rebuild our system, focusing primarily on these goals. Um, we wanted to reduce application complexity. So we're big proponents of the Unix philosophy, build things that do one thing and one thing well. And we wanted to make that carry over to our applications as well. Um, we care very much about A-B testing, so we wanted to very easily be able to run multiple versions of the same application side by side in our infrastructure so we can measure performance capabilities. We can measure whether or not we've actually fixed bugs or memory leaks. And as, as sort of an ops person, I really wanted to get rid of the problem of it worked on my machine, so it's not my fault that it's not working in production. And this idea of containerizing applications helped us solve that. And of course, because Yodler is going to be the smashingly successful product, we need it to be scalable. It needs to be fault tolerant. And because I am the DevOps person, um, I, don't want, I want to do as little DevOps as possible so I can focus building product. So we've been tracking the Docker platform for a long time. I know I'm sort of pitch, preaching in the choir here, um, but Docker pretty easily checked off the first three items for us. Um, we were able to build small Dockerized applications that do one thing well. We can run two Docker containers on the same host. They're not going to conflict with each other, check. And then finally, the Dockerized application that's in production, that image is identical to the image that I can run on my local machine. So if I can recreate the problems in production, doing it locally, my life is better. So then the question is, how do you ship Docker containers? Well, at the time, we looked around and realized that there was really only one game in town, uh, and that was CoreOS. Um, we're one of a Rackspace Startup Plus customers, and so in talking with them, uh, late summer, early fall last year, they said, hey, you really should take a look at this CoreOS. They're doing some really cool things in terms of Dockerization uh, container applications. Um, and CoreOS, as we've heard throughout the day, it's scalable, it's fault tolerant, and I really can reduce the time I do spending DevOps. Yes. So back in September 2014, as we were gearing up to really release, the, do the first major push in releasing this, we went all in. We said, we're going with CoreOS, we're going with Docker. I firmly believe that the way CoreOS is developing uh, the underlying operating system is that plus Kubernetes, I think, or platforms like those are the right direction. It's the right way to think about how to build scalable applications in the current web. Uh, of course, it was new technology. We're talking about early versions of etcd. There was a lot of times where you have an idea, you try it out, it didn't work, you want to throw your monitor out the window, you bring up an etcd cluster, you do some stuff with it, and then it locks up and you want to tear your hair out. So I want to share a couple of sort of aha moments or things that we've built and come across that I think it's really important to keep in mind if you are going from the, hey, I'm building this dev CoreOS cluster and it's really awesome to, okay, I'm going to ship CoreOS in production. What things do I need to watch out for? Number one. Etcd is a database, and you need to treat it like one. And in particular, I mean, you need to give it some space. 
if you've got a Mongo cluster or a Redis cluster or a Postgres, you wouldn't run hundreds of containers of your actual application on the same host as your database. You want your database to like, live in its own little world, give it its little protected space. And so you really need to focus on doing the same thing with CoreOS, or specifically with etcd. So this image is straight out of the Etsy, or, uh, CoreOS production deployments documentation. Um, basically, on the left, you have a core etcd cluster. It's a small set of machines that are your Etsy database. Nothing else really should run on there, other than maybe you've got some app containers to ship log systems around. On the right, you have your workers. Your workers are then your auto-scaled group that scales dynamically based on the incoming traffic. And, and Nick Weaver's talk earlier today of showing like what happens with etcd when you like have it on really heavily loaded machines, we ran into that a bunch. So by doing this, you offload the work and you allow etcd to do what it does, and then you allow the worker machines to do what they do best. Number two, etcd is a database, and you can put your real-time infrastructure state into that. By doing so, you can do things like service discovery. So for this example, on the left-hand side, we've got this REST API microservice. Go, Node.js, Ruby, whatever you want it to be. But the question is, how do I get that traffic that's in that Docker container to other services, whether it's in this CoreOS cluster or outside of it? And so we have, um, it's sort of a common pattern, this is sidekick pattern, um, where basically you have a sidekick process that runs, it's another syst um, systemd unit or fleet unit that's tied to the same machine as your microservice or service if you're not microservices. And what it does is it gets the IP import of that running container. Number two, it can do health checks. In fact, not just is the Docker container running, great, and it's, it's actually listening, but we actually bundle containerized integration tests into this. So we run integration tests against that container continuously to make sure that it actually is working, that the application under the hood is actually working. And then assuming all of that passes, we're able to publish instance details about that microservice to etcd. So now we've got etcd, which has got information about the running service, IP, import, maybe it's got version information, it's got other metadata tags that we could put in there. Once you have that information, you can now use it in other applications. So for example, if you have a HA proxy or Nginx load balancer or a pro upstream proxy, Using Comfty, which is built by Kelsey Hightower, who's been mostly upstairs emceeing, um, basically what Comfty does is monitors etcd for information and is able to dynamically rewrite template files for your services. So HA proxy, it's your upstream, so your Nginx, your upstreams. It doesn't have to be HA proxy or Nginx. You could use this if, you're, you've got, um, if you have like RabbitMQ or some other distributed system or Elasticsearch. If you need to tie together multiple nodes, you can pull data from etcd using Comfty to dynamically rewrite those templates and then restart the service, or restart that application when those things change. Finally, one of the problems that we had was how do we actually get our customers to be able to access this wonderful scalable system? Um, as Rackspace customers, or if you're using Amazon, you can use the ELB platform. Using the same idea of service discovery, we're able to dynamically reconfigure on the far left our DNS and cloud load balancers. So we're actually storing which DNS records and which um, internal load balancers map to which external DNS records and dynamically update our out external load balancers in real time based on internal changes. That allows us to scale or applicate our internal system very easily. Number three, what do we think number three is? etcd is a database, and it's got super important stuff in it. And so it's really, really important to protect that secure data. And so a sort of public service announcement, private IPv4, which you probably see in every single CoreOS tutorial, it's not what you think it is. It is probably not actually private. If you use Amazon, if you're using Rackspace, that's probably ServiceNet. It's a shared network between other tenants in that cloud, which means that your etcd information there could be open to anyone. So my recommendation is either you can try securing etcd. Etcd can be secured with secure SSL certs between it so that it can only talk to itself. Um, going through that process once was a giant pain. I don't really want to do it again. So we've shifted to using private networks. So we actually set up a private network for each CoreOS cluster, and etcd and all of our microservices communicate with each other over that private network. And this, we have our own magic private IPv4 that 
called Yodler IPv, private IPv4, that on the system's boot, we actually look at what network interfaces we have um, and then dynamically update our environmental variables so that our services can then use this. Sometimes you just need a user interface. So Docker and CoreOS have awesome CLI tools. I'm excited about the Kubernetes UI stuff, but sometimes you just need a UI. So something that um, Jared, who's one of my co-founders, he created something called Corgi, which is a simple Node.js and Angular UI app that you can run in your CoreOS cluster. Allows you to show all the running services, etcd keys, that sort of thing. Um, and there's also, while we were building this, we realized that there were some other people that had built something called Fleet UI, which, which is also kind of cool. So another problem that we ran into was this Fleet unit templates really didn't cut it for us. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Fleet and unit templates, basically you can define a service like REST API at dot service, and you can start multiple instances of that service in your CoreOS cluster by typing REST API at 1.3, sort of does a bash expansion one through three, and will then start three of those services, uh, assuming you're using the Fleet control command line. And this is great, but this doesn't really solve the problem of how do we run two different versions of the same application. If I need so if I started three of these services, now I need to have a way of like fleet API, or REST API one and REST API two and versioning of those unit time unit template files. So that's what we did. We actually templated our template unit files. So we wrote a little templater that's using Swig. You could use handlebars, um, but basically we stick uh, all the environmental variables so we can define our REST API service as a set of environmental variables, and that actually can associate the the thing that I have there that's called tag, when we actually run and build this, that tag is the git sha of the software that we use to build this specific container. So that way when we look at all of our running services, we can see the git shas of each version that's running and we can then pull down those versions immediately. This is app deploys before Kubernetes. Um, one of the problems that we ran into is we manually running all these fleet control commands and that got really, really frustrating. So we actually came up with a rolling deploy system as a service. So again, this is a templated service that we're able to run, do a fleet control start of the templated version of this service, which runs inside of the CoreOS cluster. It talks directly to fleet. It talks directly to etcd and is able to query the real-time state start and stop services accordingly. Um, it's open source. It's still very early. We're using it in production, but like, don't do what we do. Like, come talk to me if you're interested in playing with it. Um, there's still a lot of work we have to do on this. And unfortunately, we're going to be doing this until sort of things like Kubernetes sort of get finally where they need to be. Okay, so some closing thoughts. So containers definitely are awesome. Looking back, uh, I don't think we could have built this platform as quickly and as easily as this team of four that we've done um, in just a few months. Um, we've been longtime proponents of CoreOS, and that's not going away. Um, and you really can get far with just Fleet and etcd. Um, Kubernetes is really close. It's not quite there yet. I'm hoping we'll probably start experimenting with it this summer. Uh, and remember, etcd is a database. Treat it like one. Thank you. <laughs>